thing. I know a lot of you probably want to get another applause out of the way of this fantastic stash, so <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> 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 Hopefully won't be around for that much longer, but <laughs> we will see. So this morning we're going to be uh, basically right where Mike left off last week. Excuse me, if you were here, um, he was preaching on basically the first half of Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians 3.14 to the end of the chapter this morning. Okay, so let's read that. Verse 14, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just want to echo the prayer of Paul this morning, God. I ask that this morning you would strengthen all of us, God, out of the glorious riches of your gospel, that you would strengthen our inner beings so that we, Father, can continue on the path towards maturity. I pray this morning, God, that you would do a work in us, rooting and establishing us in love, so that, God, together we can get more of a glimpse, more of a realization of how great and incomprehensible your love is, and that that God would spur us on in our Christian walk. We ask this knowing, God, that you are able to do far more than we think you are. And so we ask that this morning you would surprise us, that your spirit would surprise us by how much you can change us, how much you can work so that Christ may be glorified. In his name we pray. Amen. So this prayer in the end of chapter 3 serves as a transition to the rest of the book. The first few chapters uh, are, are basically, you could say, the theological section of the book. And then in chapter 4, Paul begins by urging his audience to live a life worthy of the calling they've received. And the rest of the book basically gets into the details of what that looks like. It talks about things like, like living a life worthy of that, con that calling in the context of, of marriage and family relationships and the context of our relationships with each other, etc. This prayer says, serves to bridge the theology of the first half to that second. Now, it's clear that this prayer is closing off the first half of the book because it, it starts out with, for this reason. As uh, you may recall last week, Mike got into the for this reason, he traced it back. We're not gonna spend a lot of time doing that, um, but I'm gonna briefly comment. But first, I, I'd like to look at one other prayer, because I think as we go through this prayer, looking at the other major prayer Ephesians, it will help illuminate some of the topics that we find here. So very briefly, let's, let's read another significant passage. Um, I'm gonna go back to chapter one starting in verse 15. And you'll see that again, it starts off the same way. Paul has just expounded on some theological points, and he starts off in verse 15. For this reason, ever since I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. 
far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Just like the previous chapter, which is in the next chapter, chapter 3, this one also starts out for this reason. As it turns out, the for this reason in chapter 2 that Mike talked about, really he was probably about to start the prayer there, and then Paul kind of went into an aside, and Mike talked about that aside. And so he comes back to the prayer here uh, in chapter 3. Now what is this reason he's talking about? Well, very briefly, it has to do uh, with everything he's talked about in chapter 1 and 2. It has to do with the mystery of the gospel that has now been revealed. And what is the mystery of the gospel according to chapter 1 and 2? It is that God in Christ has determined that Jew and Gentile together have peace with God and with each other through the work of Christ. This is a glorious mystery that is now revealed to us. Okay, now let's, let's go back and look at chapter 3 a little more closely, having, having read the prayer in chapter 1. Paul begins, for this reason, for the reason of, of the gospel, I kneel before the Father. Now, it may come as a surprise that in the centuries surrounding Paul, kneeling was actually not the common way that people prayed. People typically prayed standing. And so by saying that I kneel before God, Paul is drawing particular attention to his position to heighten our awareness. A, a colleague of mine, uh, I work in law enforcement, a, a colleague of mine once shared with me, um, he had to deliver a notification to parents that their son had died in a car accident. And when he informed them of this, they were outside. And he said that the father, part of the point he was making is always make sure you go in and seat people down. He said that the father, when he heard the news that his son would be coming home, he took off and sprinted across the yard and threw himself on the ground. With so much force, when he got up, his face was covered in blood. There are, there's some news that is so powerful, whether dreadful or wonderful, that it invokes in us a position that is something other than standing. Standing, it, it, it invokes in us the desire to, to cast ourselves on the ground, to cast ourselves on our knees. Paul here says, "I kneel before the Lord Jesus. I, I kneel before the Father, because what He's about to share with us, I think, is of is of that much importance. That that standing is not appropriate. So, so what is this petition?" that Paul brings, it's so important that he doesn't take the normal position of standing, but rather than us. Well, I think there are, are really two petitions, or at least two parts to it. Here is how I would summarize both of them. The first I would summarize this way. Out of the provision of the gospel, God's spirit would give your inner being power with the result that Christ more fully rules your heart through faith. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that more, but first I want to go on to the second. The second I would summarize like this, that you would have power to understand how incomprehensible God's love is so that you might reach Christian maturity. Okay, so one, that God's Spirit would give you inner being power with the result that Christ more fully rules in your heart, and two, that you would have power to understand the incomprehensibility of God's love so that you might attain Christian maturity. Now notice in both of these petitions, the term power comes up. Well, what is this power and, and, and why does, does Paul invoke it repeatedly in this passage? Well, we get a, a good idea of the kind of power he's talking about in the, the prayer we read in chapter 1. There, Paul prays that they might know God's incomparably great power. And he says that it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him above all earthly and spiritual powers. Now, why is this significant? Why is it significant that the same power that raised Christ from the dead should be at work in their 
by extension, in our inner being. By inner being, I, th I think Paul is referring to the, the non-physical and the non-temporal parts of us that is not wasting away even while you know, our, our bodies waste away. Um, I want to briefly look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16-17 because I think it illuminates a little bit of what Paul is saying here. In this passage, there's the, the phrase of the peers, this, this phrase inner being that appears. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly, and that's the same term, that inner being term, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now, in the verse which precedes this prayer in chapter 3, Paul has just mentioned that he is in prison because of the gospel. In other words, he just mentioned the fact that the earthly powers, the powers that be, have usurped God's authority by imprisoning his messenger. Now, in chapter 1, Paul's already laid out that Christ, through his work, is now Lord of all. He's Lord over every heavenly and earthly power. So how is it that Paul finds himself imprisoned by this mere earthly power who is supposed to be subject to Christ? It, it creates a bit of a dilemma. And if you're a Christian listening to Paul, you find yourself in a bit of a precarious position. Because you also, by extension, are at danger of the message he preaches. You may be doubting who's really on the throne. After all, why would God, if Christ is indeed on the throne, allow such a blatant act of insubordination? But recall how Jesus ascended to the throne. I think this is one of the reasons God mentions the power of God that raised Christ from the dead in chapter 1. Jesus' ascension through the, the, to the throne of God is through the resurrection. In other words, the earthly powers did to Jesus even more than what they are now doing to Paul. They put him to death. But the mystery of the gospel is that precisely through this wicked act of insubordination and rebellion, it is precisely through this that God has purposed to save humanity and unite Jew and Gentile. They think they were acting out of their power, but they're the fools. God's wisdom had made the powers of this world look foolish. And Paul prays that this power, this power that raised Christ from the dead, right when the earthly authorities thought they were the ones in power, is the same power that would be at work in your hearts even while he's in prison, even while you may be facing similar prospects. In other words, he says, yes, I'm in prison and you might face similar hardship, but even if they imprison you and kill your body, the same power that resurrected Christ has the ability to keep your heart. So that even in the midst, even in the, 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 the face of, of death, the face of suffering, you, you can also remain steadfast in the faith. You can experience a resurrection of your heart that causes you to endure even incredible persecution. I think this is what Paul is getting at by the first prayer. It is a prayer that even in the midst of the worst trials we faced, that Christ's lordship over our heart would be evident and would be witness to the fact that we serve the ruler of the universe, whether or not everyone realizes it right now. Now let's go on to the second petition, and I'm going to spend a little more time in this one. Verse 17. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
Um, I'm going to briefly comment on the last phrase first. You'll notice that in my summary, when I summarize this petition, I translated the measure of all the fullness of God as, as basically a phrase referring to Christian maturity. The reason I did this is because it's a very similar phrase that appears in the next chapter, in chapter 4. And Paul further qualifies it for us there. In a few weeks, I'm going to be uh, teaching on this, this passage in chapter 4, but I just want to bring attention to our phrase here this morning. So, so in 411, it says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And here it is. And become mature, <coughs> attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Maturity here is set basically in parallel to attaining to the full measure of fullness of Christ. So it gives us a clue as to what Paul means when he uses a very similar phrase in the preceding chapter. Okay, so in the second petition here, in the end of chapter 3, Paul seems to be saying that understanding the love of God is somehow linked to Christian maturity. And Paul uses a couple pictures to illustrate the extent of God's love for us. One is a spatial picture. He says how high and deep and wide the love of God is. I can imagine wanting us to, us to get a picture of kind of the greatest structure we can imagine, right? If you've been to Destiny Mall in Syracuse, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty fantastic structure, but it's really not that high. So maybe picture something like Destiny as high as a Sears Tower, right? But even that doesn't quite get there because I, I think it's not hard to imagine a structure far bigger. So as, as, as large of something, as high and deep and far and wide as you can imagine, imagine that, and God says, that is how great God's love for us. But wait, actually there's more. Because then he says, even as far and high and deep and wide as you can imagine, even that's not enough. Because this love surpasses understanding. I mean, Paul is paradoxical here. He says, basically, I pray that you would comprehend what is incomprehensible. He wants us to understand it, but then he backs up and says, actually, really, you're not going to understand the love of God. So perhaps the prayer is something like that our capacity to understand the love of God would just be continually increased. And that, that apparently has something to do with reaching Christian maturity. Now, I want to ask here, what's love got to do with it? I mean, seriously. I can understand Paul's first petition about how it takes the work of the Spirit to cause Christ to rule in our hearts. After all, I know in my life, when I've faced hardship, when I've gone through things, it's sometimes very easy to think that God is, in fact, not in charge. So it makes sense that, that, that Paul would draw this attention to even in the midst of hardship. We need power, the power of Christ's resurrection, to, to further plant him on the throne of our hearts. That makes sense. But what does love have to do with maturity? Couldn't understanding the love of God actually lead in the opposite direction? After all, a common way that you, you hear God's love spoken of um, is, is as unconditional love. Uh, a lot of Christians have, some of you here have probably heard the, the difference between eros and agape. I know when I was growing up it was fairly common. And the idea that the, the Greek word eros you know, generally refers to sensual love and that this is kind of the love that tends to characterize humanity. It's a love that looks for something in return, right? The kind of love we see in sex. We don't do it just for the other person. There's usually some self-interest involved. And in contrast to this, agape, allegedly, is what you most often find in the New Testament, and it speaks of unconditional love. Well, as, as nice as this picture is, there's a few problems with it. One is that in the Old Testament, when Amnon rapes his sister Tamar, it uses that agape word group we find in the New Testament, in the Greek Old Testament, um, to describe his love for Tamar. So, Apparently, it doesn't always mean unconditional love because it can be used in the context of, of even rape. Um, but more than that, I think the biblical picture of God's love is actually a little more complicated than, than, than just 
our kind of one one sentence summaries we like to put on it. I think it's also complicated that the picture of love of God in the Bible by some of our, our common cultural understandings of love. In the church, we tend to talk about God's love as unconditional. And in culture, we tend to see God's love, I think, as something that is as all accepting, that is non-discriminatory. There is also a tremendous amount of talk today about living a fulfilled life, right? And usually, such conversations are focused upon living or finding your own meaning in life, your own fulfillment. Right? So when we, when we kind of take this and we, we map the love of God onto it, I think it's reasonable to ask, can't I simply structure my own life as I see fit according to my identity, whether or not it lines up with the will of God? After all, God loves me unconditionally. And if that's true, perhaps Christian maturity then is simply living out our own identity, recognizing that God loves us regardless of who we are, regardless of who we come, become, regardless of how we live our life. So, what is the love of God? Or even more simply, what is love? As I mentioned, I think the biblical picture of the love of God is a bit more complicated than we sometimes realize. I want to get a little participation here. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions, and I'd just like you to raise your hand if you agree with it. Um, and it's, you can raise your hand multiple times if you'd like. So by a show of hands, how many would say that God loves sinners and or loves the world? Okay, virtually everyone. At least a lot. Um, now, by a show of hands, how many would say that God hates sinners and or hates the world? A couple, and I think you know, I started. I think I kind of encouraged them. I might have tricked you. Well, if you raise your hand to the first question, I think you're on good biblical grounds. Right? Consider verses like the following. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Romans 5.8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 4.8, God is love. 1 John 2.2, 2, he, speaking of Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What about the, uh, the second question? We'll consider the following verses. Psalm, Psalm 5.5 5. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. Not simply even all wrongdoing, but all who do wrong. Psalm 11.5 The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. Or consider how we are said to view the world in John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Immediately it becomes apparent that the biblical picture of the love of God is, is a little more complicated. Now there's a few ways that we can handle this you know, apparent tension. I've handled a few different ways myself over the years. I remember struggling directly with this issue while I was an undergrad at Bible College. There was kind of a number of, of struggles and issues that all came together at about the same time. One of them, I think one of them that, that kind of heightened uh, my awareness to these issues was simply that I, I basically stopped, ironically, practicing the faith in Bible college. I became so obsessed with my studies that I began to view Christianity as basically knowing and believing the right things. And so I poured a tremendous amount of time into study, um, but none of that time was actually spent reflecting on, on what it meant for me as a follower of Jesus. None of that time was spent in prayer, very little in worship. It was basically an accumulation of, of knowledge about the Bible and theology. 
At the same time as I was immersed in my studies, uh, I also began to have difficulty understanding what it meant for the Bible to have authority. A lot of the, the assumptions that I had about the Bible at one time it began to erode when I, as I started to study the history of the biblical text. And as this was happening, I also, uh, par probably partly because I was beginning to feel a bit of a stranger to the faith, I began to, to feel more and more that so many Christians were so judgmental. And the problem was, it wasn't just that Christians were judgmental, but I began to think that they were judgmental precisely because a lot of the Bible was very judgmental. And so the result, it took time, but the result was that slowly I began to think that God's will was only revealed in certain parts of the Bible. There were certain parts that were clearly just a result of, of, of culture, of humanity's view of God, and other parts revealed him more clearly. And for a while I was confident that I could accurately divide between these two things, to kind of figure out where God's will was clearly, clearly revealed in the Bible, and use that as an interpretive framework to understand the rest of it. So for a little while, for example, it was the teachings of Jesus. So Paul started ticking me off, and John even more. John talks more about love, but he also talks a lot about light and darkness, and he talks a lot about those who are inside the church and outside the church. And those kind of polar distinctions really irritated me. So actually, I remember just hating John for a while. But Jesus was pretty good, right? Well, the problem is, is that even... As I studied the Gospels, I realized that Jesus didn't quite fit the warm, fuzzy picture of God's love that, it, that I had imagined it to be. He was actually pretty offensive, too. So next thing you know, my Christology kind of started to erode. My doctrine of who Jesus was started to erode. So I was like, man, he seems like a jerk in a lot of places, too. Now, not surprising, at least to me now, as I started standing kind of in judgment over, over the Bible, and I would argue to some extent over God, um, my own attitudes towards sin, my own uh, acceptance of, of sin in my own life started to change. I'm not going to say that I necessarily became way more sinful overnight, but my attitude towards what I tolerated in myself got a lot more lax. All of a sudden, my sexual struggles weren't a result of my rebellion against God, my refusal to submit to, to his plan for my sexuality, but rather were a result of the fact that God made me a sexual being. And it really wasn't a bit fair that he had such strict standards if he made me this way. My attitude towards others wasn't a result of hatred in my heart. God made me a bit of an introvert. I have kind of a, you know, a fickle temperament. And this is how he made me, and if you don't like it, well, it's just because you don't recognize the way God made me. <laughs> now, without getting into the full story, I think God was extremely gracious and, and kind of pulling me back from this. And as he did, one of the things that changed was that I, again, began to submit myself to Scripture rather than standing over it even when it was hard, even when it challenged some of my, the assumptions I had, the assumptions I had accepted. Now time doesn't allow any kind of thorough teaching of the love of God this morning, but I want to make a couple points about how I think it's described in Ephesians, and hopefully that will illuminate how the love of God relates to Christian maturity in the prayer of Paul. Ephesians 1 5, and, and I'm going to start at the end of 4, because I guess where the thought begins. It says, In love, he, referring to God, predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So this passage is that God's adoption of us was an act of love even before we were born. But more specifically, our adoption into him, his family comes not because of us, because of how lovable we are, but because of our association with the Son, with Jesus, whom God loves. It says, to the praise of his glorious grace, which 
he has freely given us in the one he loves, in Jesus. The grace that we receive comes because of our association in Jesus whom God eternally loves. To say that God is love is to say more simply than he has the capacity to love. It says that he has eternally loved the Son and the Son him. And as some of the fathers said, the bond of that love, the love itself, is the Spirit. So God's love for us comes out, is grounded in, if you will, his love for the Son. Second, God's love is not opposed to his wrath or his judgment. This is where it gets a little hard for all of us. But it's magnified because of it. I want to read... Uh, I don't know the reference here. I believe it's chapter 2, starting in verse 1. As for you... If it's not chapter 2 and you recognize it, you can stop me and be like, no, bro, you're wrong, I'll look it up. Uh, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the year, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We were by nature deserving of wrath. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Notice that in verses 3 and 4, the love of God is juxtaposed with his wrath. But the juxtaposition is not there to suggest that God is loving because he is not wrathful. On the contrary, it is precisely because, this passage says, we are deserving of wrath, that God's love is so obvious, is so manifest. We all deserve judgment. We are all, by nature, deserving of wrath, the text says. But we stand here in the grace of God today not because we're lovable, but because of the extravagant love of God displayed in Christ. Third, and I think also we get out of this passage, God's love is manifest toward us not by leading us in our sin, but by delivering us from it. Notice that in verse 1, this passage, it says that we were dead in our transgressions. Describes our state in sin as a state of death. And notice also that later in the passage, it describes the work of God resurrecting us as, verse 5, he made us alive with Christ. God's work in us is a work of resurrection. Well, if the state of sin is described as death, what does it mean to be made alive in Christ? Death is sin, what is being made alive? Verse 10, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. <coughs> sin is death. According to this passage, life is not the love of God that leaves us in our sin, the love of God that simply looks over it and says, oh, great, people are killing each other. People are hating each other. Look at the strife in the world. Look at how much we're tearing each other apart. That's okay. I love them. God loves, comes down, and intervenes by offering us a better way. By offering us a way that we can be transformed into the kind of people who do good to each other. <coughs> this is a world, right, where God's love is displayed without his judgment. Precisely because God has chosen to withhold his hand. <coughs> 
And this is the best it would get if God never judged. But the message of the gospel is not that God will never judge, but it's that God has chosen first to save us through the work of Christ and withhold judgment. And it is by Christ intervening that this world will ever become better as we submit to his love and are changed by it. So getting back to the prayer in Ephesians 3, how does understanding the love of God relate to Christian maturity? Well, again, if we understand God's love merely as, as toleration, for example, as moral indifference, and, and I think that's often what toleration means today. I don't want to you know, pick on the term every time it appears, but I think often the goal is to simply make us moral indifferent to the lives, morally indifferent to the lives of others. If this is what love is, I don't think it makes any sense to love that, to say that love somehow relates to Christians, to Christian maturity, excuse me. But if God's love is manifest in Christ in spite of the fact that he does hate sin so much, and we are so deserving of wrath, then I think it begins to make sense. Perhaps even more importantly, when God's love is understood in this way, I think it will shape how we treat one another which is a picture of how mature we are in Christ. It is a picture of Christian maturity, how we relate to God and others. We don't love others because we find them lovable. Rather, we're to love because God in Christ has loved us even though we are unlovable. A couple of years ago, I was uh, working at the Grassroots Festival and I took a complaint from two girls who had their purses stolen. And while I was taking a statement from them, um, they started chatting with me about a number of things. And the general impression that I got from them in the first 90% of the conversation was that uh, they, were, they were all about kind of being at peace with, with the earth, at peace with each other, and uh, basically living in a way that, that just was loving and, and chill. I got that impression until the end of the statement. <laughs> At the end of the statement, I asked them if they want to press charges. And excuse my language, but their response was something to the effect of, Hell yeah! Nobody steals from us! <laughs> hmm. Apparently, the desire for peace with others, love for others, has its limits peace and love for others kind of as long as you leave me alone, and if not, well, all bets are off. Now, I can't make fun of them because the reality is this is me. This is me like on a daily basis. Uh, I'm a fairly decent guy until you wrong me, and then I think about losing the, leaving the faith just so I can get back at you. <laughs> right? We, we, we tend to be fine with sin in others until it affects us, and then it's a problem. Paul is writing to a community who have deep ethnic and social differences. I mean, just to show you the extent, in the first century BC, the, there's a group of Pharisees, and, and I'm kind of going off the top of my head here, so I won't maybe get all the details right. But there's a group of Pharisees that because of their actions, that were perceived by the Roman government as revolt, something like 300 of them were publicly crucified to squash the opposition. These are the kinds of historical things that occurred in the land of Judea that set the framework for Jew-Gentile relationships. Things were really tense for a reason. Right? It wasn't just like petty racist, racism or ethnic superiority. There were real grievances there. And Paul is writing to this community and saying that God, that the mystery of the gospel is that God, through Christ, has made peace not only between himself and humanity, but between Jew and Gentile. And he's calling them not just to tolerate one another, right, but to love one another. I think the more we understand how undeserved God's saving actions in Christ on our behalf are, the more we will begin to live out that kind of love to others. 
not because we're lovable. It's because Jesus is lovable. And so we can love others who are unlovable, not because they're lovable or unlovable, but because God and Christ loves us in spite of that. This means we don't have to minimize the wrongs that others do to us. Right? Everyone will be seriously grieved and seriously wronged in this life. And it will seem like it is just to give them their dessert. But when we recognize that whatever wrong is done to us mostly pales in light of the wrong we've committed against God, that should shape how we love. It's not that others don't deserve it. It's that we were given our dessert, none of us would be here. I think it's a fitting way to close today is is simply to suggest that we pray along the same lines of the passage we read this morning. The uh, worship team can come up at any time. Specifically, I want to suggest a couple of things. First, there may be some here who feel discouraged, who feel beaten down. Right? Perhaps you're in something really difficult, a situation at work, a family situation, a school, friends, I, I don't know what it is. And, and you're asking, where is God in it? Right? It's testing your very assumptions about who God is and whether or not Jesus is on the throne. I think today it might benefit you to not only pray, but maybe even seek out prayer from somebody on the prayer team and to ask that God would strengthen your inner being by the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Okay? God doesn't expect that any one of us it's going to just triumph by kind of recognizing what the Christian ethic calls us to and then just going and doing it, right? I mean, life kicks us down. But what God promises is that the same power that took Christ's three-day dead body and raised it back to life can be at work to you to strengthen your heart even in the midst of what you're suffering. It may not be that God wants to deliver you from what you're in, but in fact that he wants to plant Jesus on your heart as the Lord of your heart right in the midst of it so that you become a testimony to the fact that this world is not all there is. So that's the first thing. The second, for the rest of us, um, as we worship this morning, I simply want to encourage you to ask God for a revelation of how incomprehensible his love is. Sometimes Christian maturity comes not by always doing more, right? You need to fast more. You need to pray more. You need to read your Bible more. But simply by a better understanding of what God and Christ has done for us. It is in that that we are saved. And though God has created us to do good, we are his handiwork, created for good works. I think the more we get a glimpse of his love for us, according to Paul, the more that will spur us on and literally empower us Whoops. towards that end. <coughs> Father, I don't think I can beat Paul this morning when I first looked at this passage, I felt that there wasn't that much there for me to preach on. Um, but the more I looked on it, the more I said, hmm, how can I possibly adequately deal with even both these petitions? So God, I simply echo Paul's words, God, at the end of this chapter. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.